Thank you. Now, if somebody will pray for me so I can get some air. When I was younger, I had more air. But see, as you get older, your air gets hot. You don't have as much because you got a lot of hot air. <laughs> oh, well. Well, it's good to be here. Right now, it's good to be anywhere. Whether I want to be here or not is irrelevant. I don't think I want to be anywhere except heaven. If I could just get there. We have a, a tremendous blessing this week. If some of you know that we're trying to move our Nacogdoches mission from downtown to out on Highway uh, 7, 21, 21, by the Sheriff's Department. We're trying to make it easier for people to get from us to the Police Department, you know. <laughs> anyway, it's a million and a half dollar project, and we've already done a lot, about a half million dollars worth. And, and we contracted with a uh, contractor to build the road through the property that we have to have. And uh, then I got a phone call last week from a foundation that was uh, part of a man that I knew that passed away and he left a lot of money and anyway they called us up and said they were going to give us six hundred thousand dollars to do the men's dormitory. It's a seventy five hundred square foot building. It's, it's actually just like this building but bigger and no air conditioning. I've had people say, Brother Jim, can we get some air conditioning? I said, yep, just as soon as I get some at my house, you can have it. But see, I'm getting old, and I'm living without it for 40 years now, and I think I'm going to make it till I'm dead. So then you'll have to make it till you're dead, right? That's only fair, isn't it? We don't have air conditioning in our house. We do have it in our car, so I sleep out there a lot. <laughs> no, it's a joke. We have attic fans just like here. Hide and seek. If you're taking notes, that's the title. Hide and seek. We're in Philippians chapter 221. <laughs> by the way, that song that I just sang was written by Dottie Rambo. She was a remarkable woman. She died just recently, about 90-something years old. She wrote over 2,000 songs, many of them in the hymn books in a lot of different denominations. Amazing, amazing person. Another person that wrote a couple thousand songs like it was Andre Crouch. One of the fellows at our mission in Nacogdoches has wanted me to sing one of Andre Crouch's songs. We've done some of them, but the one he picked, I told him I can't sing that song. I ain't got that much soul. I said, if I sing that song and it comes out the way I want to sing it, Andre Crouch will come out of his grave and slap me. So it was a beautiful song, but hard, well, very hard. We may get it someday, who knows. Starting in verse 21, for all seek. Now this word all is a word that is uh, not all inclusive. It's a general term. It's like when Paul said, all Cretans were liars. Is that the truth? Well, no. All Cretans are not liars, but a lot of them were. It's like if I said all politicians were, well, that's going to fall apart. I think most of them are liars, aren't they? <laughs> But uh, they're not all liars, but most of them are. And uh, unfortunately, you know, in every group of people, you'll find that the majority of the people are not right in the head. We've got crazy people running our country, in case you didn't know that. And so he says all these people are seeking their own, not the things which are of Jesus Christ, but you know the proof of him. Speaking of Timothy, where we left off last week, that as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently so soon as I shall see how it shall go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Aphrodite, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and that he might minister to my wants. He that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all. And he was in heaviness, full heaviness, because he heard, you heard that he had been sick. He didn't want you to know about that. For indeed he was sick, nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not him only, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. 
And I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice and that I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such a reputation or respect because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his own life to supply your lack of service toward me. Let's go back to verse 21. Point number one is gimme. We live in a gimme country. Everybody wants stuff. Everybody wants stuff for free. Gimme, 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 gimme. People want money. People want checks. People don't want to work anymore. Uh, it's pretty amazing, folks, what's going on in this country. People are selfish. We are brought up to be selfish. We're born with it, and then we nurture it to be selfish. We want to make money. We want to get gain. And we don't care how we do it as long as we don't have to work for it. We care more about self than Christ and his church. And you know what's sad? I've preached all over this country. In churches, it's just the same. There's a lot of people in there, and they go to church, and they look so pretty on Sunday, and they say amen, hallelujah, and shout Jesus, and they're just as wicked as the folks that didn't bother coming. It's really kind of sad that it's like it shouldn't be like that, but that's the way it is. In fact, most of the preachers that I've met are not right in the head. I like to say it that way. They're, uh, they're greedy. They're always looking for the next step up, their little ladder of success, you know. And it's not supposed to be that way. And I understand it. There's a great temptation when people come to you and say, man, uh, we've got this really nice big church over here. We want you to pastor. We want you to do the music. And uh, the people all smell good, you know, and stuff. <coughs> and the salary is good, you know. A yeah, big temptation. But as I've told so many preachers over the years, you have to find out where God wants you, and then you stay put. That's why I've been on this job for 40 years. I don't plan on going anywhere. I'm probably going to die here, and if I die right here, leave me alone. My wife knows what to do. She'll check my pulse, and if there's still one, she'll say, leave him alone. 30 minutes, we'll come back and see if he's dead yet. <laughs> and then they'll take my body and shuffle it off somewhere. Who cares? It's not important. Well, this guy Timmy that he wants to send over there, Timotheus, he was different. In verse 20, he said, he's the only one I have that naturally cares for you. Well, then he had this other guy, though, but Timmy was the best. And I want to send him, and I'm going to send him just as soon as I find out how everything's going to go with me. One of the things we've got to guard against is selfishness. We had six children. We've got 13 grandchildren, three great-grandchildren. It took me those first six children to learn the language. I learned what they're saying when they talk. Ah, that's I want a bottle. Ah, yeah, my diaper's dirty. You all didn't know that, did you? They always want something. Children come that way. They don't grow up saying, can I do something for you? Until you train them. It's always about, gimme, 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 gimme. You know, pick me up, pick me up, pick me up. Rock me, baby. Yeah. It's always something. That's the way we come. We were all like that, every one of us. And what's really hurting me today is I see so many people, of course not in here, it was the group that was here last week. <laughs> that are just the same. They're 40 years old, 50 years old, and they're still gimme, 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 gimme. And this gimme attitude is destroying our nation, and nobody cares. The checks that some of you are getting, they're going to stop. The government's been out of money for a long time. They just keep printing more, but they can't keep doing it. There's no more money. Social Security is broke. The whole system is broke, and it's run by a bunch of crazy people. But, just so you'll know, these crazy people that are running the country, God put them there to destroy this nation because we turned our back on God. We've kicked him out of everything. We don't let him in the schools anymore. We don't let him on in the courtrooms. We don't let him on the, on the lawns, you know, in front of the courthouses anymore. Can't even put a nativity scene out there without somebody threatening a lawsuit. You know, you, there's people trying to get us to quit preaching. There's people out there right now trying to get laws passed. So if I say anything against homosexuality, they can put me in jail. They're already doing that in Canada and in other countries, and it's coming this way. It's going to happen. My, my, folks, 
They say, oh, but that'll never happen. This is America, the greatest nation on earth. Hey, folks, don't you get it? This is a baby nation. We're only 260-something years old. The Romans were a nation for over 1,000 years. China's been a nation since about 3500 A.D., and so has Egypt. We're a baby nation. Nations have come and gone and come and gone, and we came and we're going to go. Right down to the toilet is where we're going. Because we have rebelled against God, and we've rebelled against God to the point of no return. There's really no hope for this country. There is hope for individuals in this country. You can get right with God and get into heaven. You can get right with God and have peace in your heart and contentment even when you have hell by the acre. But the majority of the people in this country are not going to get it and they're going to be slinging at each other and killing each other and backbiting and doing everything they can, trying to survive and they can't. They won't make it. <clears throat> Point number two, that many. My desire. He had a desire in his heart. He wanted to come see those people himself. But in the meantime, since I can't get there and don't want to send Timothy just yet, I'm going to send my number two man, Aphrodite. And then he gives the qualities, uh, qualifications of this man. He says, I'm sending him out of necessity. He is my companion and worker, soldier of Christ, messenger. His qualifications, these. Oh, he has eight years of seminary, and he's got a PhD. No, he didn't say that. His qualification are he wants to help you. Today, that's not good enough. Well, if you want to make it up the little corporate ladder, you've got to have these degrees. And it's really humorous to me that when Jesus, God in the flesh, picked people to be his group, who did he pick? Well, the Pharisees said they were a bunch of ignorant men, unlearned. Fishermen, tax collectors. You know, just common folk. He didn't pick the scholars. And yet the people today can't figure that out. They just don't get it. So let's dummy smile. God's not against education, folks. But what's happened is education has become their God. God is not, never has placed a premium on ignorance. He tells us to study the word, but most of these people aren't studying the word anymore. I was reading, I can't pronounce his name right, but his professor at, oh, now I forgot what university it was, but his name's Campello or something like that. And I mentioned this here not too long ago, but this guy, since the Supreme Court voted to legalize gay marriage, this guy who should know the Bible, he's a scholar, he said, after many hours of prayer and soul searching and talking to others, I've come to the conclusion that there's nothing wrong with gay marriage. Did you notice what he left out? He left out the Bible. He left out God's word. Recently, one scholarly homosexual said, the Bible only mentions homosexuality eight times. Folks, how many times does God have to say something for it to be true? Once. The fact that he meant it, said it eight times was because... <laughs> The average person can't remember anything unless they hear it six times at least, so he threw in two extras. And you know, they don't get it. We don't hate them. We disagree with them. They can live any way they want to. I don't hate them. I don't hate Muslims. I disagree with them. I don't think they're going to get into heaven by strapping dynamite on their body and going into a shopping mall and blowing themselves up. I think what they're going to end up doing is getting the shock of their life because they're going to end up in hell. I don't hate them. I don't hate the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses, even though they've got false doctrine and false Christ and they're not going to heaven, but I don't hate them. I pity them. I pray for them. And I always get joy in my heart when I see one of these people coming out of any of these groups that gets right with God, because then they see that they were wrong. And it's not just these particular sins or abortion, any sin. Sin is sin. And all sin are sin. It's just the same. It's sin. Except adultery now, you know. See, we've got a new one on adultery. If you love the person, it's okay. Somebody told me that when I said, where does it say that in God's word? 
You can commit adultery if you in love. And they don't even spell it right. Spell it L-U-V. Love. I'm in love. They don't even know what love is. They think it's a feeling. That's not, a, that's not love. It has nothing to do with feelings. I can eat a pickle and get a feeling. It's true. I do. I get a feeling. I had a pickle for lunch today. I had a feeling. Love is about making choices to treat people right in spite of how you feel. That's love. Jesus did not feel like going to the cross and having spikes driven through his hands and feet. But he did it because it was necessary for us to have salvation and forgiveness. He did it because it was the right thing to do. But it did not feel good. If you don't believe me, get somebody to nail you to some boards and you'll find out. Just please don't do it around me. I don't want to hear you scream. His qualifications were that he wanted to help. And he was sad when you heard that he was sick. He didn't want people to really know that. You know, some people, it's really funny. They get a little sickness, a little pain. They want everybody to know it. My dad's like that. I love my dad, but he's a hypochondriac, you know. Every time I talk to him on the phone, he starts telling me this whole long list of ailments he's got. He's 88, and I guess he doesn't have much else to talk about, you know. He's got all these ailments, except last time I talked to him, I said, well, Dad, how are you doing? He says, great. Me and Ramona, that's his wife, he said, me and Ramona went to the casino and we did some gambling. I said, how'd you get there? He says, I drove. <laughs> okay. My dad's funny. He's been doing this forever, 60 years probably. He'll take $100, and he goes to the casinos, and he says, if I lose this $100, I'm going home. And if I make $100, I'm going home. And every time he goes, he makes $100 or $150, and he goes home. So he gets a free trip. <laughs> He's a funny man. That's what he does. He, he won't stay there and gamble any more than that. He's not really what you would call a gambler. He's an opportunist. <laughs> he didn't want you to worry. And he was so sick, he almost died. But God had mercy on him. Almost died. Point number three, watch for him. Eyes open, pay attention. Oh, boy. You know, it's sad when you have to tell somebody to pay attention. They ought to be doing that anyway. It kind of reminds me of what people say to me, dumb things. I'll be getting ready to go somewhere, and they'll look at me and say, drive safely. Like I'm not going to? Like I can't wait to get behind the wheel so I can run over about three people? I mean, <laughs> why do they say that? Drive safe. Be careful. You know, it's a sentiment, but at the same time, some of those things don't even need to be said. We just do them because we want to hear ourselves talk, I guess. Got a lot of statements like that. I don't ask people too often how they're doing because everybody says the same thing. I'm good. The Bible says there's none good, no, not one. And so the whole world's going around saying, I'm good. Isn't that amazing? In fact, everything that God says, we do the opposite of it. God says one man and one woman, and we're trying to change that into a man and a man, a woman and a woman. And now they've already started talking on the radio about polygamy. That's the next thing that's coming. Do away with the one man and woman. If you one man and five women or one woman and five men, it won't matter. Anything is going to go. Then after that, it'll be bestiality. Then after that, it'll be the pedophiles that want their rights so they can rape children. If you don't think that's coming, you just got your head in the sand. It's coming. We're on a slippery slope, and we are gaining speed while we're going down. I was listening to the radio today, and I was really agitated. Public radio. There was a man giving a speech somewhere where somebody, some black person got killed by a police officer before this other thing happened. And the man said, black lives are important. And boy, the crowd said, yeah, 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 yeah. And he said, white lives are important. They said, no. He tried to say all lives are important. They wouldn't let him. They shouted him down. What is this about? Black lives are important. White <coughs> lives are important. I'm Mexican. Mexican lives are important. All life is important. Why should one life be important and not another? But you could hear the people shouting this in the back. Just over and over, they were chanting it, that white lives were not important. Of course, I don't care that much about gringos. I like Mexicans myself. But. Except for Martin. 
we're buddies. But see, he lived in, in Denver City, and that's so far out in the middle of nowhere, he's almost Mexican. <laughs> that's a bunch of stupid stuff we're doing. Everybody has value. Of course, some people don't have as much value as they think they have. <laughs> some people are really self-important, aren't they? I, I, I know about that. The Bible says never think highly, more highly of yourself than you ought to. And we're pretty good at that. But wrong is wrong and right is right. Yeah, actually, color doesn't matter. Right is right and wrong is wrong. And that's where the problem is. We're not willing to deal with issues anymore because we don't want to call anything right and wrong. We don't want to call anything sin. We just want to do what we want to do. So pay attention. I'm going to send this guy, and I'm sending him there to bring you joy. Now, there's a big difference between joy and happiness. And I hope if you don't learn anything else tonight, I hope you learn this. Happiness is dependent upon things. The more things you have, the more happy you can be. You take a man, it's my illustration, so don't tell me I can't use a man, I'm using a man. Take a man, and you give him a nice wife, and a nice house, and nice kids, and he lives on a nice street, and he has a nice job, and a nice car, and a nice paper boy. Well, that dude can be reasonably happy. But when you test somebody, you have to take everything away from them. You have to read, read the book of Job sometime. So the man's house burned down. His wife leaves him. His kids don't like him anymore and cuss him. The dog bites him. The paper boy hits him in the back of the head with the paper, and then he calls his boss to tell him to be late, and his boss says, you're fired. You got nothing left. And he's going to react in one of two ways. He's going to sit on the curb, and he's either going to say, woe is me. If it wasn't for bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. Or he's going to respond as the word of God says and say, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's only two possibilities you got. And most of the people are going to say, I'm having all this bad luck. And they blame others, justify their problems that they create themselves. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people that have drinking problems who told me that the reason they were a drunk or an alcoholic was because society made them that way. Society did it to them. These people over here, this group did it to them. It was my mother. You know, when I was five years old, I was sitting in the high chair eating spaghetti. My dad came through and bumped the high chair. I fell down, the bowl of spaghetti fell on my head. I've been seeing worms ever since. And when I cried, my mother slapped me, and I said, now I'm a drunk. There's a lot of people that went through stuff like that that are not drunks. I keep telling people this, and this is true. If there's anybody in the world that should get drunk, it's me. For 40 years, I've been looking at people like you. Some of you look back at me with that, I wish you were dead, preacher, look. I learned to read that, you know. Are you dummy? Why don't you shut up? I'll sure be glad when this is over. I didn't want this. I just came here for the food. And then complain about free food. So I tell people all the time, so if anybody's got a reason to get drunk, I got one. Actually, I got a million of them. But I don't do it. I learned this lesson a long time ago. God said, do not be drunk. And so I found out a little secret. If you don't want to ever be drunk, what's the best thing not to ever do? Drink. Well, don't drink. If you don't drink, you will never get drunk. Isn't that a funny concept? Some people can't figure that out. <clears throat> Joy that God gives is not dependent on things. It's dependent on your relationship to Christ. You can have joy in your heart, peace, unspeakable and full of glory, peace that passes understanding, and contentment, and you can be in an empty room. You don't have to have anything. As Paul learned, he's going to talk about that in the next chapter, whatever state I find myself, I've learned therewith to be content. Nancy and I have been through that. We've been times when we've had lots and times when we had nothing. 
and we've learned to be content. It doesn't matter. I don't find too many people that are content. I had a guy working for me. He only worked for me about two months in Livingston. He was my yard man. I was paying him a salary. Plus, I gave him his own place to live so he could be by himself, you know. And then I got a call this morning. He just packed his bags and just threw his keys in and walked off. Evidently, he's not content. I've got a brother up in Nacogdoches. Works for me. He was working for me. I told him, I said, Richard, I'll pay you $8 an hour. He said, well, that's not very much. I said, Richard, I'm giving you a place to live, food to eat, everything else you need, all your needs are met. When you look at it that way, that $8 an hour becomes quite a bit. Because I've had a lot of people that will go off and leave and get a job making $12 or $14 an hour and then come back and tell me, you know, it's funny, ever since I moved out and got this job, I don't have any money left over. When I was living in God till I always had money. Well, yeah, you didn't have any bills. <laughs> the people just don't think. They're just not content. My wife and I and Martin and Mary, we don't make much money. But we've learned how to use wisely the money we've got. And that's why we've got stuff. Of course, we don't smoke and drink and party and, you know, go weird places and spend money. We give a lot away and we buy things that we need that produce more money. But that's another concept some people just can't get. They want to know, I want to know, Paul says, that you are okay. So I'm going to send him to cheer you up and to cheer me up. Be glad he's coming and look up to him, respect him. He's an elder. Paul said, Follow me as I follow Christ. I could say the same thing to you. Follow me as I follow Christ. But if I ever quit following Christ, you better have enough brains to quit following me. That's why you need to read the Bible for yourself. How else are you going to know? Most people don't read the Bible. People that go to churches, most of them, the only Bible they get is what they hear on that sermon Sunday morning. And because they don't know the Bible, the preacher can tell them anything he wants to. TV preachers, are, that's, they, they make their money that way telling you stuff that's not true because you don't know. That's why I can't watch them because I know. I just turn it off. People always ask me, what do you think about so-and-so? I say, turn it off. Read your Bible. One time I was praying. I was reading this book by this professor. He was brilliant. And... Uh, I prayed and I said, God, what that man said in that book is profound. I wonder where he got it. God spoke to me very plainly. He said, he got it from the Bible. Go and do thou likewise. <laughs> well, that's where all the truth comes from. But we don't want to quote the Bible. We'd rather quote Dr. Fuzzy Face. Respect the elders. That's a lost art in our time. I have learned more from older people. Uh, we have a pastor friend, he's 88. Tomorrow we're gonna take him out to lunch. We do this every few months, we go out to lunch with him. I have learned more from him and people like him. Young people come along trying to tell me something, they ain't got anything to say. They don't know anything yet. And they don't understand that. And then they disrespect their elders. They don't wanna to listen to them. I'm not saying they're all brilliant, but they do know a lot. They got a lot of experience. And you can learn from them. So I always try to find people that are older than me so I can learn something. For the cause of Christ, this man's life wasn't even precious to him. He was willing to die to further the gospel. Oh, well, Brother George, one time when he was pastoring a church there in Nacogdoches, I was sitting there and I, I was pretty amazed at what he said. He said, how many of you in this crowd, there's like 1,200 people there, he says, how many of you would give your last drop of blood for Jesus? Oh, I don't know. Well, the whole place went crying. They erupted then. Yeah. He said, who give the first? Dead silence. It's easy to say you'll give your last drop of blood because you don't think that'll ever get here. But who's going to step up and give the first? Kind of reminds me of that country and western song. Guy says, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to go right now which I don't understand because a Christian, somebody who really loves the Lord, they want to go now. 
I would have been glad to go yesterday. I was excited that we're going to build this building, but I don't have to see it. If I die before that and get to go to heaven, I'd be much happier. As Paul said in the first chapter, to be with Christ is better. I was talking to a good fellow one day, and he says, Oh, Brother Jim, you're always talking about going to heaven. You want to go to heaven. You want to go to heaven. I said, That's right. He said, Well, I, I'm not ready to go. I said, Why not? He said, Because I don't know what heaven's going to be like. I said, Well, I know one thing about it. And he said, What's that? I said, It's perfect. What else do you need to know? Guys, if you ever found a perfect woman, what else would you need to know? Girls, if you ever found a perfect man, it ain't going to happen, but you know. If you ever did find a perfect, what else would you need to know? You wouldn't need to know anything else, would you? Because they're what? Perfect. Heaven's like that. Heaven is perfect. You don't need to know anything else about it. We do know that perfect's got to be better than this. I finally figured out, you know, we were raised Catholic, and they told us back then that there was a purgatory, you know, you have heaven and hell and then purgatory in the middle, you know, and if you went to purgatory, then somebody could pray you out, you know, and all this kind of junk. Well, I found out that their concept wasn't true, but I did find out where purgatory was. We're in it. This is the only place we can get, we can get prayed out of. If we get right with Jesus, we can get out of here. If we die without Jesus, we're still getting out of here. One way or another, we're getting out of here. So I figured this must be purgatory. <laughs> Listen, the Christian life, and that's what this is all about, the Christian life is all about service to others. It's hard not to be selfish. Selfish comes naturally. It's hard to get rid of that. Self-preservation. Selfishness. But Christianity is about serving others even if it costs you your life. That's what dying to self is all about. But we don't want to do that. I'm not going to die to self. I want everybody else to die to themselves. I want my wife to wait on me. And don't ask me to do nothing. So my wife learned. She doesn't ask me to do nothing. She tells me. She says, you better get with it, son. I said, okay. Nah, I like to tell people I do wear the pants in my family. Yeah. Every morning she tells me which ones to put on. <laughs> yeah. But other than that, yeah. <clears throat> seriously, it's really hard to be unselfish because it's ingrained in us. We're, it's drilled into us. That's the way we come. But if you want to walk with God and you want to be the kind of Christian that's pleasing to God, you're going to have to learn how to serve. Jesus was God himself in the flesh. And he said, I came not to be served, I came to serve. He could have came to be waited on. He deserved it, but he didn't. He came and waited on others. He didn't have to die for us. He could have just said, I'm not going to do it. I got a song I'm going to sing pretty soon about that. I'm not going to do it. They're not worth it. And he'd have been absolutely right. We're not worth it. But he loved us anyway. And you ought to be really glad about that every day that God loves you. Because you don't do much to make him love you. He just does it. Oh, it was that other group. I forgot. It's the other bunch. <laughs> Father, we thank you for loving us. And we do thank you for your word. And we pray, Father, that somehow, some way, you would get it across to these people and instill it in their hearts to read your word, to read your word, like I was telling my brother this morning when he said, well, David had God to speak to him. And I said, son, you've got more of God's words in that book than David ever had. David didn't even have a Bible. Here we've got it. Everything we need to know for life and godliness right in front of us. And there's even those special times when you speak to us in our hearts because not everything we need to know about our life is in the Bible. But everything concerning godliness and the quality of life that will please God is in the Bible and everything that will get us into heaven is in the Bible. Everything that can help us to escape hell is in the Bible. And these folks in this room need to read it for themselves. 
We thank you for the Christians that are in here, but we pray, Father, that they would learn about this service thing so they can be examples to others. So many times people on our staff over the years have not been an example, even though they said they were Christians. They actually hurt the cause of Christ because of their greed, their selfishness. And I pray, Father, that wouldn't be the case here. We thank you. We're so grateful that Jesus paid the penalty for our sin, for us from the dead, and for us to return. We thank you again for meeting our needs today. We're very grateful that in all three of our missions, nobody has to walk over to today. So bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.